then Jason and was back there singing as well. And want to make sure that uh, the mothers are here in the service this morning and, uh, and be a part of this. Uh, this day, of course, is always special. Every Sunday is special. I also want to make mention that uh, we'll go back to the regular uh, next week of the morning service, potluck, afternoon service, and we'll continue that on through unless otherwise stated. But uh, uh, we will get a generic sign-up sheet out there. Several have asked, several ladies have asked, and so we'll get that out there. If you would, turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus. In the last couple weeks, we have heard much about a subject for years, I guess, but in the last couple of weeks, the uh, decision made back in 1973, Roe versus Wade, and how uh, the Supreme Court hasn't come out and said, but uh, intentionally leaked information uh, on the uh, overturning of Roe versus Wade. And it was, it, it was uh, illegal at the time. They should have never uh, heard the case. It should have never been passed. But we've heard much about it. It's amazing how all of a sudden this is in the news and, and all those people who talked about this gender identity suddenly became women again. Isn't that amazing? And uh, uh, you look at any application and it will ask, what gender are you? Not 14, only two, male and female. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about it, but I've, I've read several, uh, no less than 30 or 40 articles in this last week, week and a half, watched several videos on <clears throat> the subject of abortion and uh, pro-life and pro-choice uh, and looking at uh, both sides of it and and, uh, you know, many times, and one who is not a Christian said so often we hear uh, the Bible pushed on pro-life. And you give us all of your Bible verses, not going to deny those things, but you have to look at it scientifically. When does life begin? And when and what does <clears throat> the science behind it say? You know, it's interesting in a culture where we live, <clears throat> our young people and society is being uh, co really uh, cultivated and conditioned to speak of the unborn human being as a fetus, a clump of cells, or a choice. It is important not to uh, disguise what abortion really is. It's gruesome, inhumane, violent, horrific, Terribly damaging, not only to the unborn person, but to the mother, fathers, community, society, and nation. Uh, I know this is Mother's Day, and I'm going to preach on uh, the man with two mothers and, uh, this morning. But you cannot talk about motherhood without talking about the life that is given. Here's an interesting fact. In 1973... There was a law that was passed, and uh, it was the uh, federal law uh, covering those endangered animals. Do you know that killing a pre-born turtle, it is illegal under federal law. It brings a $100,000 fine, one year in prison. Uh, killing a uh, pre-born bald eagle, breaking an egg, carries a $250,000 fine and two years in prison. Killing a preborn human being, a baby, is legal under federal law, funded by the government, applauded as empowering women. Isn't it amazing how we uh, have, and I say we because we've allowed it. In Exodus, let me read a verse. I was going to read it in a second. Let me read a verse in the Bible. In the, uh, I think you know where I stand, but 1 Corinthians chapter number Six, when a, let me say this, uh, no Christian, no Christian, no Christian should ever, ever, ever be for pro-choice, ever. They should be pro-life. If you are a Christian and you are a woman, 
you do not have a right to your body. If you are a Christian and you are a man, you have no rights to your body. You belong to God. If you're a Christian and you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you belong to God. You say, how do you know that? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You say, well, I disagree with you. I believe that a woman have a right... To her body. She had a right to not get pregnant. She had a right to not sleep with the man. She had a right to um, do all of those things. But once she got pregnant, you have no right. You have to protect that child. I'm not going to back away from it. You say, what happens? And I mentioned this last week. We're going through uh, the blueprint, the foundation for a Christian home. I'm sick and tired of hearing Christians talk about, I'm not mean-spirited about this, but I'm sick and tired of hearing so-called Christians say, listen, they have a right. No, you don't have a right. We're going to talk about when does life begin? You know, this is Mother's Day. I probably should have waited and said this after I said this. This is a wonderful day, but it's bittersweet for some. Some have lost their mothers. My wife's Mother, my mother-in-law, went home to be with the Lord over 20 years ago at the age of 58, and, and uh, I truly enjoyed my mother-in-law. I say that 100% truthfully. I had a great mother-in-law. Uh, she liked to argue with me, and, uh, and, and I've said that before. She would call and say, you know, I've been reading that NIV. I really like it. I think it's a good Bible. And I'd give her why it's wrong, and the next week she would say, you know, uh, I, I'm King James only. You know that. You know that, right? And I said, well, I've been reading the NSAV. Man, it's easier to understand. And she would give me uh, uh, just a, a, she wouldn't give me a piece of her mind. She'd just give me the whole thing. <laughs> I remember at Christmas and uh, uh, pleated pants. Those were straight from hell. Ungodly, sissified, wimps. In a cuff in the bottom, are you serious? You ought to wear bloomers with them things, she'd say. I said, I like them. I made sure I wore them in front of her, not bloomers, <laughs> the, the pleated pants. <laughs> Just to clarify for a second, I saw your mind run and say, what did you wear? Uh, she would, uh, every time that she would uh, talk to her daughter, my wife, she would say, make sure you punch him for me, and she'd give me a hit. In the shoulder, when my, when my mother-in-law was on her deathbed, and we drove from Illinois out there, and, and uh, she was in induced coma, and they took her out enough uh, because of the pain that she was in in order for us to uh, be able to speak to her for a moment. And I stepped up there, and she raised her hand and, 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 and hit me. I thought, well, yeah, you got one last hit. You don't know when they put you back under, I'm going to slap you. But no, I didn't do that. <laughs> Uh, with that, but uh, I had a godly, godly mother-in-law. I've got a godly mother. I thank the Lord for the home that I brought into. Uh, for most, mom is a very special person. For some, uh, the memories that they have are not that special. Uh, this uh, uh, Mr. Bush said this, not president. It said, to become a mother is not so difficult. On the other hand, being a mother is very much so. Any a woman can be a mother, but it doesn't mean that they are good mothers. We have to be careful as we approach this topic, though. Not all mothers deserve to be uh, elevated to that uh, uh, pinnacle of, uh, uh, of motherhood and blessed and honored. And there are many that are not a Proverbs 31. I thank the Lord for the ladies that are in this church and, and uh, those that are visiting uh, 20 years in June. And that, that we have known the Byers family. So glad to have Renee. And uh, pray for your husband, Dave, every day. He's a police officer. We need to pray for our officers and the sheriff's officer down south, canine unit. And uh, 
um, uh, you got a nephew now who's a who's a sheriff's officer, and uh, and they've all said the same thing. I said, "Would you pull me over if you saw me speeding?" They said, "Yes." Would you give me a ticket? Yes. Wouldn't that be a great sermon illustration for you? Not really uh, with it, but do pray for them. But uh, in church, faithfully raising their boys faithfully with the Lord, uh, we have been blessed with the mothers we have. Uh, some were not even uh, getting the stories we could tell you. You've heard them all, but we probably got some we can make up. And uh, knowing Kaylee before she was even in, in her uh, teen years, and the uh, uh, Lord has been good. You know, when you look at the subject of motherhood, some ought to be revered. Great and real mothers are special. Real mothers would like to be able to eat a whole candy bar all by themselves and drink a soda without any floaters in it. You know, it just gives, can I have a bite of candy bar and a drink of your Coke? <laughs> no. I see my daughter back there, she's, she's like, oh, hey, you're going to be there. And they don't drink, they sip, they put their whole mouth, they eat. It's half eaten, they take a drink, it goes back in, and, and now you have a shake instead of a drink. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Real mothers know that their kitchen utensils will probably end up out in the sandbox. Of course, they know that their knives will be used as screwdrivers by their husbands. Um, Real mothers often have sticky floors, dirty ovens, and happy kids. Real mothers know that dried Play-Doh doesn't come out of carpet real easily. It also does not belong up the nose or in the ear. Uh, real mothers sometimes ask, why me? Then they hear that little voice that says, because I love you. You know, real mothers are an integral part of society and in the home. Real godly mothers you know, we wouldn't be where we are today. In fact, let me give you a scientific fact that is true. None of us would be here without mothers. Uh, uh, I know that that is, is deep for some of us, but if you're here, it's because you had a mother. How many agree with that? You're still awake. You're not sleep. Some of your mothers are saying, how did I get that out of their nose or ear? Uh, beans are not made to go up in a child's nose. Isn't it amazing? No, it, probably not as much girls as boys, uh, but boys want to see how far can it go up before I can take it out. Oh, it'll go a long way up there. Trust me on that. And you say blow real hard and, or suck real hard, maybe it'll come out the other way. I don't know. And if you go get a COVID test and it's stuck, they're going to push it out the other way anyway. How many have had a COVID test? You can feel it back here. Um, you know, they say, I'm not trying to hurt you. You liar, you are too. Uh, that's why you do that. But when you think about, uh, when you think about mothers, I want you to look at Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, and the Bible says, Exodus chapter 2, and verse number 1, the Bible says, And there went out a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was goodly, a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of, bull, of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the riverside and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, 
and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. If you have a habit of underlining in your Bible, underline the first phrase in verse number 2, and the woman conceived and bare a son. In my Bible, I, I have that highlighted, and then I circled the word son, bear a son. If you look over at verse 10, partway down, it says, and he became her son. If you underline that phrase as well and circle the word son, you could say that Moses had uh, two mothers. You could say that he had two mothers that influenced his life in a tremendous way. You know, both of the women fulfilled the material role of the life of Moses, made certain choices in regards to Moses' life. If you look at his mother, she made a choice for her son. The Pharaoh's daughter made a choice for this young baby. I want us to look at this this morning, and the woman conceived and bare a son. He became her son. There's several things here that I want to give you and some things I want to read here this morning. Allow me a few things and, and points uh, the, the, of choices that they made. The very first one is they chose to give Moses life. They chose to give Moses life. Now, if you read chapter 1, the decree of Pharaoh came out and they were to, if you bore a son, that child had to be, uh, that, that, that young boy had to be killed. Uh, they many times would take him to the Nile River filled with crocodiles. They would throw the child in there and that child would die. From the Hebrews, because if we do not uh, kill the Hebrews off, they're going to overpopulate us and they're going to take over Egypt. So you look at them, they both chose to give Moses life. Consider the choice of Jehoiakim. Moses was born into a culture of death. Moses was born into a place of decree like I mentioned. Could you imagine we're, you know, of course you know that we're going to be grandparents. We're excited about it and, and uh, just some eight weeks away they're going to, uh, hopefully uh, the baby is going to come. I shouldn't say baby, Hadeline Harper, uh, the one and only spoiled granddaughter. Uh, that, we, that, 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 that we have. We are excited about this baby. We know it's going to be a girl. But could you imagine in that culture being pregnant and begging and pleading God that the child within you is a girl, not a boy? When you ask a, a young couple that's expecting a child, you say, what are you hoping for? Most of the time, the mother will say, whatever God gives me, I'm excited about it, whether it be a boy or a girl. Many times the husband will say, whatever God gives us, but I'd love to have a boy. Um, and uh, uh, you nice thing, Brother Mitch, you, you have boys, you've only got to pay for two weddings right now. Think if it were flipped. You, you'd say uh, four, three. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're like, well, I knew that, but then I have someone back there going, I'm like, where's the fourth one? And I said, three weddings. But so you're going to have to prorate that down there. And you got 500 bucks you can spend on your wedding uh, for that. And, uh, but could you imagine? With that, your first son comes out, and you have to put that child to death because it was the law of the land. As a Hebrew mother, they would have Egyptian midwives that would help. The Egyptian midwife, that was on purpose 
so that uh, there was no chance for the, the mother, the, the, the Hebrew mother, to say, uh, no, we're going to hide this child. I believe the Jehochebed did not have a Hebrew or a, a, an Egyptian midwife. But she chose to give him life. Imagine the pregnancy, imagine the waiting, imagine the expectation and then all of a sudden Moses is born or the baby is born and it is a boy and you have a choice to make. There were no ultrasounds to discover the sex. They had to wait until the child was born. When she did, she gave birth to a goodly baby boy. The word goodly has the idea of being good, pleasant, agreeable and happy. In other words, he was a lovely baby boy. Now, all children are uh, uh, beautiful babies. All children are unique in their birth. Um, our niece is, is about just a touch older than, than Tad is. And when she came out, uh, she was, you could put her on her head, spin her like a top. Uh, she was a cone head. She was 99% uh, bold. And, uh, and you say, man, she's a beautifully unique baby. She's a beautiful baby. Uh, you know, um, I'll get myself in trouble, so I'll leave that alone. She's a beautiful young lady. Um, <clears throat> could you imagine, though, his mother chose to disobey the command of Pharaoh. She allowed her son to live. By the way, both of Moses' parents were involved in the discussion to give him life. In Hebrews eleven twenty three, it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. They feared God more than they did man. Both Jehochebed and her husband said, listen, there is no way that we can kill this child. There's no way that we can take his life. Now, uh, this story, of course, is about Moses. I believe others probably were hid and, and lived. So Amron and Jehochebed hid the growing baby for as long as they could. Of course, others knew that she was expecting. How do you, how do you uh, uh, tell them, you know, where did your belly go? Listen, you, you know most of the time when a lady is expecting, especially in that eighth month. Um, are you pregnant? No, I ate a watermelon, you know, a sage growing. Um, are you expecting? No, it's just the way I look all the time. Um, I'm speaking about me. All the time. How could she explain a pregnancy that had gone on that long? Her faith in God would not allow her to murder her son. But her faith in God was so great, willing to trust God with the life of her son. She could not kill the baby, but listen, she could not secure the baby either. She said, I cannot take his life, but I cannot, I cannot protect him. I cannot secure him. So she made a little basket of reeds, applied pitch, put a lid over it, and put the baby in the Nile River that's filled with crocodiles. But adrift on the providence of God, the baby's older sister stayed nearby to make sure nothing happened. It went into some, some reeds or some bushes and while the maids and Pharaoh's daughters, you know the story came out, uh, they saw this basket, they opened it up and the baby is crying. She immediately knew this was a Hebrew baby. Why? Because the baby was circumcised. She said this is of the Hebrews. You look at this story here. Death for a baby Hebrew boy was a law of the land, as I mentioned. She could not destroy him, could not kill him, so she put him in. But I want you to consider the choice of the princess, though. We look at what Jehochebed did and, and the decision that they made, but what about the princess? What about Pharaoh's daughter? 
Her father made a decree, and that decree had to be followed by everybody. No Egyptian woman could hide a Hebrew baby. That would deem a rebellion against the king, against the pharaoh, which would bring death upon you. Of course, if you read through history, it did not matter. If you were a child, kings put their children to death all the time. But the daughter of Pharaoh comes down and she sees this. She investigates and realizes that it's a Hebrew baby and immediately understands that his mother had chosen life over death. Immediately she understood that uh, this, this mother chose to give this baby life. Now we are told that she had compassion on him. The word compassion means to spare or to have pity on. In that instant, that princess had a choice. Do I overturn the basket and let the child drown or do I give him life? And of course, we know that she gave him life. You know, as she would have had to do was just tip him over. This pagan princess, born into a culture of death, chose life for a child who should have been killed. The Bible says she had compassion on him. I was reading several articles and... and uh, we live in a culture today, a culture of death. The screaming of Roe versus Wade and how wrong that is and it shouldn't be overturned. It never should have been put in place to start with. Do you understand the whole concept of it was the depopulation of black people by the Democratic Party? That's not my words, that's just fact. It's all about depopulation. You see, we need to look at when does life begin. There are some out there, there are some, and, and young people don't use some of these terms at home, there's idiots out there that call themselves uh, preachers. Theologians, they know the Bible. When does life begin? Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, when God breathed into them the breath of life. When a child takes their first breath, that's when life begins. The problem is that's not science. That's an idiot talking. That's an ungodly, sinful person who ought never hold that title talking. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to say let's, let's quit trying to let culture tell us what is right. Just let God's word teach us. The Bible says at the moment of conception there is life. You take Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. The Bible says God said before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee and I ordained thee a prophet. You remember when Mary went to a visit Elizabeth her cousin and she told her what had happened. And the Bible says that the baby jumped within her. You can look in Psalms where it says that you formed me in the womb. When does life begin scientifically? For the sake of clarification, let's divine, define what it means to be a living being. In the most scientific sense of the word life, it means an, orga, an, organism, an organismic state characterized by capacity for metabolism, growth, reaction to stimuli, and reprodu reproduction. So when do human beings enter the state of having life? There's terms out there, the quickening and earthquakes. History states that the first instrument for recording earthquakes was invented by a Chinese philosopher, Chang Heng, in uh, A.D. 132, before Chang Heng's clever seismoscope, the best way to tell if an earthquake occurred was through experiencing physical sensations. So how did you know that there was an earthquake? Well, when the ground shakes, buildings are falling, and the walls start cracking, 
That's a pretty good sign that you're having an earthquake. How many agree? Things are moving. How many of you have seen videos of an earthquake taking place and buildings are shaking and people are trying to stand? So he came up with an invention the size of a scope. Now, if the ground was shaking, houses were falling apart, suddenly large pieces of land split open and separated, tectonic plates, you were place. Of course, since Hang's invention, we have developed even better tools for understanding earthquakes. Not only do we know when earthquakes occur, but that sometimes they occur even if we don't feel them. Seismograph technology helps us study the Earth's movement. Now, we, would, we know that it would be silly to think that earthquakes do not take place just because we don't feel them. Hey, did you know an earthquake took place? No, it didn't. Why? I didn't feel it. But technology and science would prove us wrong. How many agree with that? How many agree with the fact that we know that earthquakes at the minute uh, power we can detect with the technology that we have and created and constantly creating better technology? Now, for thousands of years, society recognized a pre pregnancy as living when a woman could feel the baby move inside her. This moment of tangible evidence for life was known as the quickening. The term they gave it was the quickening. All of a sudden, uh, a mother uh, uh, feels the baby move with inside her, that, that tingling, that sensation. I remember when, uh, when my wife was pregnant, the first time she felt Tad move, she said, I think I felt the baby move. Now, of course, we knew that she was pregnant given the technology and, and, and other things we realized that she was expecting. But this is what they would call it. Like the seismograph, the invention of ultrasound technology revealed that the presence of life was more than a collection of physical sensations. When does life begin? Life begins at conception. While some argue that there's no way to know when life begins, advancements in technology and medicine say otherwise. Several object tools produce evidence that life begins at conception. Research into the moment of conception has revealed some significant hints at the exact moment that life begins. Now, this study uh, is from, let me uh, give the person, Christy Piper. I read this on Focus on the Family. Ultrasound technology. While ultrasound technology was first applied to the field of medicine by Ian Donald in 1956, it was uh, wider used for ultrasound in the 1970s. Of course, we know Roe versus Wade in 1973. Now, ultrasound technology has improved and evolved exponentially since the beginning. Now they can detect a baby at 8 to 12 days. When the egg and the sperm fertilize, they can see the baby in 8 to 12 days. They can see this. You say, oh, so life begins then. No, additional evidence of preborn life can now be viewed through 2D, 3D, and 4D ultrasounds, embryology, and genetics. Now, I've cut a lot of this out, but let me read a few things about this just quickly. As previously mentioned, having life means being in ownership of certain potentials. For example, we could say, by net definition, that a living human holds the potential to grow, metabolize, respond, and reproduce. However, we certainly wouldn't consider a human any less if they cannot give a child. A mother that, that cannot bear a child, you would not say that that person is any less of a woman. Likewise, a person with limited motor skills 
or an inherited metabolic dis- disorder. According to studies, listen to this, according to studies, in embryology, a developing embryo contains unchanging genetic information for the life it contains. Consequently, a full-grown adult contains the same genetic blueprint as they did as a developing embryo. Knowing this, we can reason that genetically speaking, life begins at conception. When that conception takes place, the DNA of that person is forever and unchanging. If you take a baby and you find out you, at the moment of conception and you uh, take a DNA test and then you look at it uh, 70 years later, it did not change one bit. When does life begin? Many medical professors agree that life begins at conception. Moreover, they acknowledge that mother and preborn child are two patients. Each may be treated and diagnosed differently since their medical needs may vary. As Dr. Jerome Legerman, a father of modern genetics, stated, to accept the fact that after fertilization has taken place, a new human has come into being is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. It is plain experimental evidence. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. Oddly, the practice of treating mother and baby separately and as separate separate patients changes when the topic of abortion comes into play. I was talking last night, Lee and I and, and the kids were talking last night that it's amazing prosecutors, some prosecutors, I'm not saying all, will say that they'll defend the right of a woman to make a choice. It's her body, her choice. And if she wants to abort that baby, she can. But if a mother who is pregnant gets killed in an accident, she will, uh, she will try to prosecute the person uh, who performed this with two murders. The fact is, is life begins at the moment of conception. Jehochebed and both uh, uh, her and uh, the Pharaoh's daughter realize that this is life. You know, let's face it though, the facts today, we live in a culture of death. You know the most dangerous place for an unborn child is in the womb? The most dangerous place for a child is inside the womb. You say, but listen, you've got to look at the fact of rape. I have to look at the Bible. It's life. I won't get into all the facts because of the sake of time. Do you know that only less than 1% of those that claim they've been raped and become pregnant actually become pregnant? 1% because of the body and everything that it puts off. Not getting into all the arguments on that, but do understand the Bible still says it's life. We don't have a right to take the life of a child. You want to look at what's being passed and pushed through and the bills that are trying to be pushed through uh, that a mother can have a child and they have certain amount of time, 30 minutes to an hour to decide, do we want this child or do we not want this child? If you don't want the child, the child can be put to death after the child is born. How foolish. Of course, you have late-term abortions that you can get right up to the point of birth. That's murder. I'll make no apologies for it. It's murder. I do say this, we need to pass some laws to make it easier for parents or for couples to adopt. They say it's thirty to 40,000, I read this week, 45,000 to adopt a baby. That's ridiculous. They ought to make it where... A mother, uh, there, there's no, uh, the, 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 there's no cost to her, but it's a lot cheaper to uh, adopt a baby. There's many women out there that love to have a child that cannot have a child, would love to adopt, but because of finances, they're unable to. We need to vote pro-life politicians into place. 
need to pray that God makes a change. But both of them chose to give life. They both chose to give Moses love. Both of the women God placed in the life of Moses loved him more than they loved themselves. Let me say this again. Both of these women loved Moses more than they loved themselves. Just because she was the princess did not mean that her life was spared. If Pharaoh found out what had happened, she could be put to death and definitely the baby would be put to death. And of course, Jehoshaphat loved the child. His mother, his birth mother risked her life to save him. The adopted Egyptian mother risked the wrath of her father. Why would they do this? I believe the only reason is love. They loved Moses more than they loved themselves. Jehochebed loved Moses because he was her son. Her body gave him life and nourished him as he grew. Her love for Moses allowed Moses to fulfill the greatest earthly destiny ever designated or designed for the Hebrew at that time. He was drawn out of the river and later he would draw out the children of Israel, the Egyptian, uh, from Egypt. Think about how God used him in a great and mighty way. Because his mother loved him so much, she risked everything to save him. Her love allowed him to fulfill a God-given destiny. I believe that God has a plan for every life. The same thing in, in, in Jeremiah's life. Before I formed thee, I ordained thee a prophet. I believe that God has a plan for each and every child that is born. What's our duty? What's our job? Our job is to spend time in God's Word. Never kick a door open, but never close the door that God gives you. We need to seek out what God's purpose for our life is. I'll say this, God does expect us to be a full-time Christian. A full-time saved person. Just because we're in church, we shouldn't live a life, one life in church and live a different life outside of church. The Bible says they will know you by your works. You look at the love that she had. But the princess loved Moses because God put it into her heart. There is no reason, not one reason under the sun why this woman should have kept Moses other than God put love and compassion into her heart. That's the only reason. God's purposes are always fulfilled. Man can never outrule God. God's decisions, God's rules are always. You know, it's hard to escape the irony of the situation. Pharaoh had to pay for a Hebrew to be reared. And at some point in time, he was going to come against Pharaoh and remove his children. Isn't God good all the time? Remember, we serve a God that's in charge of all things. God's still in charge. You know, we look at all that's taken place in our country and we look at uh, what has taken place uh, with elections and politicians and, and, and this whole gender uh, identity. And, and, and how ridiculous I'm sorry, I just, I don't know. Uh, the Bible says that Satan has blinded their minds. The whole thing is Satan has blinded. I cannot say I'm a woman. I may not have any type of, of internal organs that a woman has, but I'm a woman. Now you may act like a girl sometimes, but you're not a woman. These people, you cannot say that, I'm a, that, that I am not a woman just because, yes, I can, genetically speaking. There's, i got to stick with this because it, it just gets you, you know, this binary garbage. And, you know, uh, I think that one of the local schools, what's cool here locally, uh, has put litter boxes in because they have some children, as it did in Iowa. Uh, what school is that in? There's one locally that they are putting, because there's some students that have identified as cats, and they did this in Iowa, they have put litter boxes in the restrooms. The janitor has to clean it up. It would be a cold day in hell before I ever cleaned a litter box out of a lady's bathroom at a school because some adult person used it. 
I'm sorry, I'm not doing it, I'll get a new job. And there's a lot of them out there. That goes back to society and parents. If my sons came home and said, Dad, I'm identifying as a cat. I'd say you're a fool, but you're going to eat cat food out of a bowl on the ground. You're not eating on the table. Get in all fours and eat then. If you're a cat, eat. A cat doesn't sit at my table and hold the utensils. No, they never did. Uh, they, their favorite animal is, is not a cat, so maybe if it was a dog or something. Tom, if you ever died and came back, you would not be a dog. He loves dogs. But can you imagine a society that embraces it? I, uh, I, I'm in love with my dolphin, as I did, and I think it was in Britain and uh, England that, that, that she married a dolphin. Seriously. Now, if a extremely rich woman marries her dog and she dies, and the dog's a, a, uh, a widow, I'll marry the dog to take the money. I might do that if the, if the money's good. Can you imagine, you know, the one lady married a dog and left millions. We live in a society, you say, oh, that's just, no, it's satanic. It's evil. I thank God for the, mo the, the, the mothers that Moses had this. God is in charge. God spared Moses for, from certain death because he had a plan for this man's life. You know, if you're born into a family where you receive love, you should rejoice. If you have been loved, you have been blessed. Even if your uh, parents are not saved and they have loved you, you need to thank God for them. You need to honor them. Thank God for mothers who love their children. An illustration, Max Licardo offers some intriguing insights into a mother's love in his book, A Gentle Thing. With some exception, here are the comments. Moms, why do you love your newborn child? I know, stupid question. Why do you? For mothers, this baby has brought you pain. They've made you break out in pimples and waddle like a duck. Because of that child, you craved maybe sardines, crackers, maybe it was orange sherbet, pickles, and you threw up in the morning. They punched you in the tummy. They occupied a space that wasn't theirs, ate food that they didn't fix. You kept them warm, kept them safe, you kept them fed, but did they say thank you? Are you kidding? She's no more out of the womb, and she starts crying. The room is too cold, the blanket's too rough, the nurse is too mean, and who does she want? Mom, don't you ever get a break. I mean, who has been doing the work for the last nine months? Why can't dad take over? But no, dad won't do it. The baby wants who? Baby wants mom. She didn't even tell you. She was coming. She just came. And what is coming? Oh, she rendered you a barbarian. You screamed. You may have even swore. You bit bullets and tore the sheets. And now look at you. Your back aches. Your head pounds. Your body is drenched in sweat. Every muscle strained and stretched. You should be angry, but are you? Far from it. On your face is a longer than forever love. They've done nothing for you, yet you love them. They've brought pain to your body and nausea to your mourning, yet you treasure them. Their face is wrinkled, their eyes are dim, yet you can talk about, oh, you can talk about our, her good looks and bright future. She's going to wake up every night for the next 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 years, and uh, it doesn't matter. I can see it on your face. You're crazy about her. Why? Why does a mother love her newborn? Because the baby is hers. Even more because the baby is her. Her blood, her flesh, her sinew and spine, her hope, her legacy. It bothers her not that the baby gives nothing. She knows a newborn baby is helpless and weak. She knows babies don't ask to come into the world. And God knows we didn't either. 
We are His idea. We are His face. His. We are His eyes, His hands, His touch. We are Him. Thank God for parents that love their children. Think about a mother that, that gives birth to a child. The pain that is involved. You said, Pastor, you do not understand. I can sympathize with you for a little bit with kidney stones. They say it's as close to it that you can come to having a baby. I'm telling you, after the first one, I'd have never had a second one if I was a mother. That much pain. Why do you? Because you love. During the, during the delivery, I will never have another child. It is all your fault. It is your fault. It is your fault. And if I ever get my power back, I'm going to kill you and tell God it's suicide. Because it's your fault. Two weeks later, oh, it would be so nice to give you a little brother or sister or another brother. Why? Because they love them. The last thing here very quickly is this. They chose to give Moses leadership. Both of the mothers gave Moses and invested themselves into his life. Now his Egyptian mother gave him the best that Egypt had to offer. In Acts 7, verses 21 and 22, And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for, his own, for her own son. And Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. This means that she gave him the best education available. Moses was a brilliant man in all subjects known to mankind. Every subject, Moses knew it. She gave him the best she had. It is possible that Moses, by virtue, and I've studied that, I believe that he was in line to become the next Pharaoh, even though he was a Hebrew. She gave him the best that she had. But his birth mother gave him something his adopted mother could never give him. You see, his real mother introduced Moses, and, and when I say his, I should say biological, I shouldn't say real mother, because I know there's adopted children. You say, oh, is, is my adopted mother not my real mother? Yes, she is. Um, but a biological means is in, in understanding the gist of the conversation here. She told him about the one true and living God. Now, when she nursed this baby, it wasn't for six months, eight months to a year, it was probably up to the age of seven or eight years old that she took care of him. So during that uh, time period of, 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 of the education and how a child will learn 70-80% uh, during those first three or four years, she would have warned him about the false gods and religions of Egypt. She would have told him the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She would have told him about the reason the Israelites were in bondage. She would have told him about the promises of God and to deliver his people from bondage. She would have instilled in him a, a heart and respect for God. She would have told him about the upcoming Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 27, it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of, of the reward by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. You know, by the time he was grown, Moses understood what God's plan was for his life. Think about the decision Moses had to make. Of course, we knew that we know that he was a murderer. He looked at the Egyptians beating the Hebrews and he killed them. In Acts 7. It says, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. Why do ye wrong one to another? 
But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. You know, the lessons that Moses learned from his mother were set in action and set in course. They instilled, she instilled godly principles, godly character, godly wisdom. She instilled God's word into Moses. Those developing years, it's so vitally important to put God's word into your children. It's vital. You know, it is with children we have been given the responsibility to raise. God has given us a responsibility. You know, again, uh, not to overstate it, which I will, uh, my granddaughter is coming into the world, but that child doesn't belong to me and doesn't belong to them. It belongs to God. They have a responsibility to train that child. When they are older, they make decisions that may not be godly, may not be right, but we pray we'll bring them back. We'll instill godly principles. You know, we need to give them something that universities and schools can never give them. We need to give them a knowledge of God. You know, if a child leaves your home and doesn't understand all the mathematical problems and may not be able to dissect a... Uh, uh, a sentence in English it may not be able to do all of those things, but you gave them a good Bible, in, a Bible education, they're far better off. Let me say this, I would never negate the importance of education. If a homeschool, private school, a public school, we as parents have a responsibility to make sure that child is being taught. We homeschooled our children, and I believe that uh, both are, are uh, you might only hear me say this once or twice, I believe both of our, our sons uh, are brilliant, take after their mother, that's the only part you're going to hear me say once or twice. They are, both of them are very well educated. They were homeschooled. They scored extremely high in the ACTs and SATs. Well, homeschooling, you can't teach them anything. You, you, let me, I'll get myself in trouble. There's not much education in a public school. A lot of humanistic teachings. There are some that they can't afford to send them to a Christian school. And even in Christian schools, there's sometimes not a great education. But it's still the responsibility of the parents to make sure they're being educated. When that child comes home, follow up with them. Make sure that they have a great education. You know, it's amazing that, you know, uh, the mother will say, my child, until they get in trouble, then it's your child. You wait till your dad gets home. Why didn't you just take care of it then? I don't want to be the mean person. Beat him before I get home. And I will uh, talk to him when I get home. No, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, my son's laughing back there. That's why I said that. Don't beat a child. But the Bible does say spare a rod and spoil a child. It does talk about the, the blueness of the wolves. That's for another subject. Kids are saying, go on, preacher. Don't, don't park there for a while. But listen, we need to have a knowledge of God. What I'm saying is this. In the culture in which we live, parents want their children to have more than what they did. We want them to have a better education, a better home, a better life. But we should do everything in our power to cultivate a love for God. We should pray with them and pray for them. We should read the Bible with them and to them. We should take them church faithfully we should see to it that they are involved in the programs of church we should see to it that they have a personal walk with God we should make sure of those things well I can't make my child read his Bible you make them do their schoolwork. I can't make my child go to church 
but you make them go to school. Well, they have to have school, do they? They have to have the Lord. Yes, and education is important, but I'd rather have a child that may not know everything and is saved than have an educated fool that hates God. You see, let me say this and in closing, and I know the time, I forgot my watch, that's the whole reason I can't see the clock back, I can. Let me say this, I believe it's vitally important to have your children in church. Not just socially, but spiritually. When you say, oh, we're not going to church this week, or we're not going to go to church tonight, we're going to go do this, is what you're telling your child is there's other things more important than God. I'm not saying you don't miss once in a while. Do not misunderstand me. But it has become convenient to miss church. Well, you don't understand. Let me say this. Don't ever say to me, I don't understand. When I was in kindergarten, I had to go out and I had to scrape just a little pad that was about an 8 by 8 pad before. The, I shouldn't say kindergarten, I'm sorry, in first grade. Kindergarten was a pass. In first grade, before I went to school in the morning, I had to scrape this pad of natural fertilizer that cows would leave. We had 30 minutes to get off the bus uh, when I was in junior high, and then we went to high school 20 minutes from the time you got off the bus to change your clothes and go out and do chores. It wasn't until I was later on when you'd bale hay, uh, Brother Larry, they'd bale hay, and Brother Wayne, you've known my parents, you've been up there and baled hay. Uh, we bale on wagons now, but they used to bale on the ground, and then we'd have to go in front of them and roll the bale twice out of the way. I didn't realize till later on that they could actually drive between those rows. They were forcing us to work, slave labor. This was, where was Child Protection Acts when I was a young person? Uh, the, 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 I mean, talking about slave labor, they taught us things. But Sunday morning, we would get up, we'd go out and do all the chores. We'd run in, take a, a half a bath or a sponge bath. We'd get dressed, jump in the car, drive 45 uh, minutes to church. We'd go to Sunday school. We'd go to morning service. We would leave there, run home, eat. We'd go out and do chores. We'd run in, clean up. We would get back in the car, drive 45 minutes to church. We'd have church. We would go back home. Wednesday night, we'd get off the bus, we'd do chores, we'd go uh, take a quick bath, we would get dressed, we'd go to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night, and I was born reared on a farm. You say, well, you don't understand. I understand that I didn't want to do it either, but my parents made me. But it wasn't really making me, they led us to church. We need to be in church. Wow, they just didn't really want to come. One of these days, they won't come at all. You know, there's so many things that you could read here on uh, how to raise a, a child that is a delinquent. There's so many things that we do. But folks, I thank God for the mothers we looked at today, but I also thank God for the mothers that He has placed in this church. You know, I, I'm looking forward to being a grandpa. I really am. I'm looking forward to reading the Bible with my granddaughter, talking to her about the Lord. I'm excited that the times that I get to watch her, and, and if I'm up here at the church and she's in the office with me, who knows what the office is going to look like. I had a bed for my dog Max. There's going to be Doll houses and everything else probably in there. We're not going to put a uh, we're not going to put a uh, a saddle on the bear. We'll we'll keep her off from that. I want her around church. I want her around God's people. If I could beg you, make sure you're a godly influence to her. But make sure you're a godly influence to all of the young people in this church. I was thinking. My wife and I was talking. I said, you know, and, and I've said this, in, in 15 years, I'll be 70. 
In 15 years, we're going to have a ton of young people still in the church. In 15 years, I still need to be serving God, loving God, reading my Bible, praying, spending time with God, but so do you. Mothers, there's no greater responsibility than to be a godly mother. But dads, there's no greater responsibility than to be the leadership of the home. It's sad to say that most, most children come to church because of mothers, not become a fa- because of fathers. I don't believe that's true in this church because I know each and every father in here. And for some of you, it takes a lot of work. But God will bless you. This man, Moses, had two mothers, both invested in his life. We need to invest in the lives of our young people. How? Giving them godly wisdom. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us this morning. And in this, maybe some of these things give us some thought. Life begins at conception. And to become a mother, you have a child. When does a, a mother become a mother? Does she become a mother, Lord, when the baby is born or at the moment of conception, biblically? I believe at the moment of conception she becomes a mother. And you're allowing her to raise this child and, until it is born and the responsibility they have. Lord, we have such a responsibility, especially in this society. We need to train, we need to raise, we need to rear our children in godly principles. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior, and they'd like to know. I won't embarrass you, I won't pull you down, but is there anyone like that this morning? Say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I do not know the Lord Jesus Christ is my personal Savior, but I'd like to know. Nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning say, Pastor, I want to be a better parent. You don't have to raise your hand. God will see it. I just want to get back to the book and be the example that I need to be. We need to be the type of parents that God has ordained us to be. Don't look at it as a chore. Look at it as a wonderful, wonderful responsibility that God has given us. The phrase that The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I believe that. Dear Heavenly Father, be with us in these next few moments. We love you. Pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. If we would stand.